Hi there. I'm Seth Abramovich, senior writer at The Hollywood Reporter. Welcome back for another episode of It Happened in Hollywood. This week, we're going to be revisiting a new wave classic from the mid-80s that launched several lasting careers, including John Turturro, Aidan Quinn, Rosanna Arquette, and, certainly last but not least, Madonna. All that and more on It Happened in Hollywood. So it's a story as old as time, and it's the one where the pop star wants to become a movie star. You know, sometimes it works out, sometimes it doesn't. We've seen Harry Styles now trying to ascend to movie star status, and uh, it's a bumpy ride if you've been following the drama around Don't Worry Darling. Lady Gaga, very good job of it. And then you have people like Cher, who didn't really start acting till much later in her career. And she ended up becoming a Oscar winner, despite being laughed at in her early roles. Well, Madonna had an interesting case because she got her first major movie role before she really exploded. She had a few songs in rotation on MTV. And as you'll find out in today's episode... She was on the wavelength of a very promising young director named Susan Seidelman. Susan was a film student at NYU, and with her first film, called Smithereens, she found herself sort of the toast of Cannes. It was set in the post-punk world of downtown New York and followed a woman who was trying to recreate herself into sort of a punk princess, very much keeping in step with the themes of desperately seeking Susan of, of image recreation. That one ended up going to Cannes as the first indie film ever in contention for the Palme d'Or. And suddenly Susan found herself fielding scripts and offers from studios. Desperately Seeking Susan, which was not named for her, was the script that spoke to her the most. Again, it was a story about transformation. In this case, it's a comedy of errors where two women, a tough-talking sort of Betty Boop, Mae West type, who's very streetwise, switches lives and personalities with a sort of bored housewife living in New Jersey. That was Rosanna Arquette. And in one of many instances of dovetailing this season on It Happened in Hollywood, Laurie Metcalf, who had a small part in Leaving Las Vegas, plays Rosanna Arquette's sister-in-law in this film. Anyway, enough preamble. Let's get to it. We have Susan Seidelman, and she's going to tell us how this great comedy, which really holds up and I really enjoyed watching recently, came to be. Welcome, Susan Seidelman. This is such a thrill for me. I mean, you kind of set the roadmap for my life in a lot of ways. Desperately Seeking Susan was everything to me, uh, you know, as a tea early teen when I saw it. It it kind of was my vision of what coolness was. And I would actually like sought out different locations. You know, I moved to East Village eventually, but um, when I first went to the East Village to visit my sister, I went out and found shooting locations and I couldn't believe I was on the sacred ground of Desperately Seeking Susan. So thank you, first of all, for, for coming. This is such a thrill. Thank you, Seth. I'm happy to be here. So, you know, on our show, we kind of go through how uh, something like Desperately Seeking Susan that everyone takes for granted, how it, it happens and how it almost doesn't happen and all the different doors that had to open to make it happen. So uh, first, I'd love to just give a little bit of background on on you and how you became uh, pretty early on in your career, a very formidable uh, filmmaker. Why don't we talk about Smithereens, the film that preceded Desperately Seeking Susan? So uh, how did that film come about? Well, I, I'm originally from Philadelphia, and I moved to New York City in, the, in 1974 to go to NYU Film School. And um, just a little bit of backdrop, uh, New York City at that time was, was pretty funky because there was a, a recession going on. Uh, actually, New York City was bankrupt, I think. And so um, it was kind of crumbling. And uh, the good thing about that, it was 
that it was very cheap to live in New York City. And the streets had a lot of texture. So it was at NYU um, Film School, which was then located on 7th Street and 2nd Avenue, kind of in the heart of what was the East Village back then. Uh, you know, I started noticing that there were some interesting things going on culturally because the hippie generation that had been, uh, you know, part of the East Village was kind of fading away and something new was happening, although it didn't quite have a name like punk or new wave yet. But you could see that culturally something interesting was going on. And I think that that's uh, sort of living there and watching this happen uh, was what influenced me to want to make a movie about it. So at, at film school, I was making short films. When I graduated in 19, I guess it was 77, um, I stayed in touch with all my former classmates. And we decided uh, eventually, let's try to make a, a feature film. Um, we didn't really know how to go about doing that. We didn't have any money. But we knew that there was something, or at least I knew there was something interesting going on that I wanted to talk about. And I also knew that there was a certain kind of um, scrappy female protagonist that I wanted to try to capture on film. So um, it was, you know, trying to do that, that was the impetus for making Smithereens. In your class at NYU, were there any other people that went on to, to big things like you? Um, in the class uh, below me was Jim Jarmusch. Oh, so wow. I knew him from from film school. Yeah. Oh wow. Okay. So so that's sort of the the time and place. And um and now Smithereens went on to become the first what American film in, cap in competition in Cannes. First American independent film in competition. Yeah, that was kind of weird. <laughs> wow. So that so so that's it. Your first film, and you're off to Cannes. On the quasette with with your film, yeah, yeah, it was it was pretty surreal because uh, I was pretty naive about the movie business back then. I mean, first of all, I was in New York, not in L.A., and back then, film school, you know, we all loved Jean Luc Godard. We weren't thinking, you know, we all wanted to be Bergman, Godard, Truffaut. We we uh, weren't really thinking about uh, agents, and I wasn't thinking about you know, how to get my film distributed, or I didn't even know anything about film festivals. I had heard of Cannes. That was the only festival I really knew of. And on a whim, just decided to send them a postcard to apply. Forgot about it. About a month later, I got a call from a, a French person <laughs> uh, saying, um, you know, I'm a representative of the Cannes Film Festival. I'm in New York. Bring your film to this address. Uh, the film had just literally just gotten out of the lab. Uh, in fact, I took it from the lab straight to the screening room and showed it to them and then got a call a couple days later basically saying, let's meet and talk about it because uh, we're interested in your film. And I had no idea what that actually meant. I also had no idea what doors that would uh, eventually open up for me. Unbelievable. That is just, so, I mean, such a testament to your talent, obviously, you know, out of the box. So, such a cool story. So, obviously, it did have a huge impact on what you're, you were able to do next and your power and your, your agency. Um, and I guess th there weren't a lot of uh, female directors that were had that kind of say, but suddenly you did. And so what did you want to do with it? Well, I... Uh, I, I... Growing up, I mean, I didn't even know of any female film directors. I had heard of Ida Lupino because she was an actress in the 50s. And the only, when I was in film school, the only American film director that I had heard of or knew and had watched a movie from was Elaine May. I had seen The Heartbreak Kid, which I loved. But um, we're talking the mid-70s. There really weren't any um, except in Europe, there were people like Lena Wertmuller and um, Agnes Varda and a couple other European female directors. But, uh, you know, um, so I really had no role models. But once I started to make films, and around this time, there were a few more of us, 
Uh, Amy Heckerling was doing interesting work in L.A., and she was an NYU film student who uh, I didn't know of, but I know she was in the undergrad. I was in the grad school. Um, but I had seen around the time, or maybe it was shortly after Smithereens, I had seen Fast Times at Ridgemont High, which I loved. Sure. Barbara Streisand had made a her first movie, Yentl, around that time. But this was still about five, seven years before you'd get Penny Marshall and Nora Ephron. So there really were still very few of us. And because of that, I did... I had heard a horror story about somebody who had made a low-budget uh, indie film, a, a female director of a low-budget indie film, went on to make her first studio movie and was overwhelmed, had a really old-school, heavy producer over her shoulder, and the film did not turn out successfully, and she kind of disappeared. So I thought, I better be really smart about the next film I do, um, anyway, I was sent a lot of scripts. Most of them were pretty terrible. And, you know, a lot of, oh, sort of teenage girls in sororities or babysitters or, uh, you know, it was a genre that I wasn't that interested in. Um, but, you know, I knew I, I just had to be, I got, I, I figured I'd have one shot <laughs> at doing a studio movie. I better you know, picked well. Uh, and then I got out of the blue this script uh, called Desperately Seeking Susan. And um, it it had that title. I didn't put my name in there. <laughs> right. I, um, being superstitious, I did see this as an omen that this script was desperately seeking me to direct it. <laughs> and I love this story. It was sort of right up my alley because it was, um, you know, the two leading characters, one was sort of a suburban girl, which is a suburban housewife, which I could have been. I grew up in the suburbs of Philadelphia. And the other one was kind of a street savvy, you know, New Yorker, which is what I sort of was becoming, um, you know, having moved to New York and, uh, you know, just sort of dealt with New York life for for several years now, so um, it 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 felt perfect. And also, the theme was something I was really interested in, which was this theme of transformation or reinvention, which is something that I also had played around with in Smithereens. That's about a a girl who's also trying to kind of reinvent herself as like a rock star of sorts. So it had all the right elements. And then when we're getting to this, of course, you cast the pretty much the the master or mistress of transformation in Madonna. So you you really, I mean, I, it astonishes me I, the whole Madonna of all of this and how you set her on this path. So why don't we just get right to it? Because I'm sure people are hungry to know. So you have this script. There's a character, a very streetwise um, sort of hustler person. It's a very cool part. And um, who does the, uh, so who's the studio you're working with on this? It was Orion, Orion Pictures. And um, and so did they have thoughts on who could play this part? Well, um, Rosanna Ar Arquette had been cast first. And she was kind of her, she wasn't quite a star yet, but she was sort of the next generation of star. She had uh, done a TV movie um, with Tommy Lee Jones that had gotten a lot of buzz. Um, it was an executioner song. Executioner song. She had done yes. that and she had gotten great reviews. She mm -hmm. had done a John Sales movie called Baby It's You mm -hmm. that she was very good in. And she had just gotten or she was about to be cast in a um, the Martin Scorsese movie with uh, Griffin Dunn. After Hours, which we did an episode on. So it's, yes, everything's yes. coming together. I love that. So she was our star. You know, she was the person that the studio said, okay, at this budget level, which was under $5 million, if we have Rosanna, Rosanna Arquette, we can then look for another up-and-coming person. Uh, although at that time, the people that we were looking at and the people that we auditioned were 
up and coming um, movie stars like uh, Melanie Griffith. Who else? Um, I think Kim Cattrall. Really? Uh, Linda Fiorentino. Who's in After Hours as well. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think Kelly McGillis, uh, I auditioned at the time. Um, I forget the others, but it was that generation of of actresses, many of whom would go on to become leading ladies. Um, But having done Smithereens and worked with a, a musician named Richard Hell in that movie and liking so much that he brought his persona to the part he played in Smithereens. I wasn't afraid to work with a musician, a non-trained film actress who just had a really interesting buzz, (laughs) you know, something special about them. And uh, I was living on um, Thompson Street at the time, and it Turned out that uh, Madonna was living two blocks away on Broom. And I had known about her because I knew a bit about the music scene in New York. And, you know, she was playing at different clubs. And, you know, I had heard about her. And um, this was the early days of MTV. So suddenly, uh, you know, there weren't that many rock videos yet. But she was one of the early... She had one of the early music videos on MTV, and I think it was uh, Holiday or Lucky Star. And um, I could see that the camera liked her. You know, I saw the video was, you know, playing a lot, and she had that kind of, uh, knew how to flirt with the camera. And, um, you know, she was sexy and... uh, Yeah, just had something different about her. And so I thought, let's bring her in and and meet her and see see what happens. The studio needed convincing because they had never heard of her. (laughs) So how do you even reach out? Did you walk over to Broom and knock on her door? (laughs) Or how did you find her? She she had been had a little part, but just as a band member in a movie called I think it was called Vision Quest. Oh, sure. Yes. Yes. She was just playing a member of the band. So I knew what I had heard that she wanted to move into movies, but had not had a, a scripted role yet. And did you audition her or what? how did you? Yeah, we. Uh, I auditioned her. I thought she was really fascinating. But the, the challenge was to convince... Uh, especially the people in uh, in L.A., Orion's office in L.A., Mike Metavoy, um, who is the president of production, that this unknown person would be a good co-star. It was an important role. It was this, you know, the lead or one of the two leads. Um, and then a funny thing happened. Fortunately, um, Mike Metavoy had a teenage son at the time who watched MTV and thought Madonna was cute. So he must have told his father that this girl was cute <laughs> or sexy or whatever he said. And uh, Mike said, OK, if, uh, let's do a screen test. And we went out um, to Ed Lockman, the cinematographer, and I, and maybe about three or four other people went to Union Square Park, I think, one of the parks in New York, and just did a, a screen test with her. And again, no one was even really paying much attention to what we were doing. I mean, people weren't really looking. I do remember there was one, you know, pedestrian that walked by and said, oh, look, there's Cindy Lauper. But other than that, you know, we, we, we did the screen test, showed it to uh, the folks in L.A. They saw that she had something special and, uh, and let us uh, make the movie with her. Is it true that they insisted she take acting lessons? I don't remember them insisting that she did. I do not remember that. But I do remember she had a acting coach she was working with because I think she wanted to do a good job. And, you know, you need to kind of learn how to break down a script. And, you know, so, so I think there was somebody that helped her with all that stuff. 
you know, I had watched it on TV recently and I tweeted about how great the film was. And uh, a lot of people were responding that it's her best uh, film acting and you you got that out of her. Was it something you were doing magically? Because, you know, she went on to some not so great performances or or was it just that you were capturing lightning in a bottle that no one had discovered yet? And it was just about being at the right place in the right time. I think it was the right part for her. You know, it was, and it involved acting. You know, I've I've read, you know, reviews or interviews where, or, you know, somebody will say, oh, she was just being Madonna. But it's very hard to just be Madonna when there's lights and there's marks on the floor and you're saying scripted lines. That's That's acting. So... Uh, but I think that the it, it was just the right part for her and also at the right time because it was fascinating. We were filming for nine and a half weeks and there was such a big difference in her level of fame from the first week that we started to the last week when we finished. Our first scene was shot. It's a scene where she's walking down the street eating cheese doodles on St. Mark's Place. <laughs> no one was paying attention to us. You know, some people on the street would stop and look and go, oh, they're making a movie. But uh-huh. it was very low-key. No security, no entourage, nothing. By the end of the film, uh, we did need security. And, uh, you know, I think she had, she was, either she had just been or we knew that that week it was coming out, she was going to be on the cover of Rolling Stone magazine. So her life had you know, really skyrocketed in that period of time. But but I felt I was lucky because I didn't have to deal with personal hair and makeup people on the set. There wasn't anyone. There weren't assistants looking at the monitor. It was a very relaxed atmosphere on set. And did her increasing you know, rapidly increasing fame, uh, stress out the other actors or the production, or did it all just happen so fast that you didn't have time to think about it? Well, for the production, it was amazing because the timing was so perfect. We got to work with the the the, the street hustler, you know, Madonna persona while we were making the film, and then when her her career skyrocketed we got the benefit of all that publicity for the release of the film. So it it couldn't have been more perfect. Um, I think if it took a toll on anyone, and I, and, you know, I think she's spoken about this, it might have been Rosanna. And they seemed, they got along fine on, uh, during the making of the film, but Rosanna had been the star, you know, and the, the uh, other character was the, was going to be the unknown or the up and coming star. And suddenly the pressure of the film being suddenly called the Madonna movie, you know, the ads said the Madonna movie, the posters had stickers, the Madonna movie. That has to be difficult. That has to be a little difficult. In the end though, I think they both benefited from the buzz that the film got. Yeah, I mean, it's such an amazing showcase for both of them. So does, did she arrive with her, I mean, when I think of the classic original Madonna look, that's the look, is this character. So did she bring that to the set, or did you help her find that with wardrobe? Or She brought a lot of it, uh, but she, uh, in fact, you know, I was working with a, a a production designer who was also the costume designer named Santo Laquasto. And um, he had done a lot of Woody Allen movies. And this was the first time he was going to be bo- both the production designer and the costume designer, which really helped to kind of coordinate the look of the movie. But he was smart enough to just go to her to her apartment and look through her closet and pull out some stuff. So, you know... 
several of the, you know, bits of wardrobe literally came from her closet. You can see that in one scene, she's wearing an orange kind of cut off sweatshirt that has the initials MC on the, you know, <laughs> on it. Um, Madonna Chicone. The thing that was uh, Santos, and it was interesting because I didn't know this until fairly recently, the tuxedo jacket, the pyramid jacket was Santos' invention. And uh, I had heard that originally when he showed it to Madonna, she didn't like it. And it's weird because that pyramid jacket has become so much a part of her persona of that time. I gotta have him, man. 65 bucks. That is the price. Forget it. I like the jacket. It used to belong to Jimi Hendrix. Yeah, but I bet he'd love it if I swapped it for the boots. Deal. But it's such a, a a key prop. It's like the MacGuffin of the whole film. It drives the the, the plot, which is a mistaken identity and um, amnesia. And um, so, what was it written as in the script? Because it, to me, it's like it's like the Maltese Falcon <laughs> that jacket. You know, the script was written by a woman named Leora Barish, and when we were working together to, uh, on revisions for the script. It is absolutely a MacGuffin. And there were so many, you know, in one draft, it was a guitar. It was like a guitar that had something in it. Um, at one point, there was uh, a postcard with a stamp, and then we realized that had been done already in charade or charade. <laughs> <laughs> and then somehow um, the whole idea of adventure and you know, Egypt and ancient Egypt and the pyramid uh, being both a symbol for a kind of mystical symbol, a symbol for adventure, but also a symbol of materialism because it's the symbol on the dollar bill, on the back of the dollar bill. <laughs> oh, my God, totally. It seemed like the right combination of of uh, of images. <laughs> Again, you're anticipating material girl. And um, and then in just, it, you know, they keep saying at the store that it first it belonged to Jimi Hendrix, then maybe Mick Jagger, I forget, but there's a, they keep changing the story. And of course, now it belongs to Madonna, who's at the same echelon as all of them. The, the yeah, whole thing just, yeah. just tickles me, just how much you anticipated uh, with her. And then one other scene I wanted to ask about with her is when... Uh, she dries her armpits in the in the bathroom. Now, I hadn't seen the film in a long time, and when I saw it, it just hit me like a ton of bricks. It, and to to me, it reminded me of uh, the Marilyn over the subway grating, <laughs> like it was that iconic. So, could you tell me a bit about that that sequence? Yeah. Now, it was uh, that was a scripted moment that she uh, changes her clothes in the ladies' room of the Port Authority bathroom. <laughs> um, and, and that she dries herself using one of those blowers. It was Madonna's idea to flip the blower around and dry her armpits. That was hers. <laughs> that was just a wonderful, cheeky, improvised moment that, uh, you know, she brought to, to that character. Genius. And she was easy to work with? Like, we didn't get uh, difficult Madonna? We got... I got easy Madonna. I got I got very uh, excited and I found her very easy to work with. And we had conversations about stuff be beforehand because I I knew that this was kind of a a wacky twist on a screwball comedy. And I had always liked those 1930s and and 40s um, screwball comedies because the women were always so feisty and strong in them. So we had conversations about, you know, those movies. And I suggested her, you know, going out and renting several of them just to kind of grab that that kind of a tone and... and um, and she then went on, I think, afterwards, after Desperately Seeking Susan, to make another screwball comedy. I think it was called Who's That Girl? Yes. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't think it was as successful as this no, one. No, it wasn't. But, uh, <laughs> and Sha <laughs> but, uh, Shanghai, uh, what was that one? Shanghai Surprise? Shanghai right? Surprise. Yeah. <laughs> but certainly um, echoes of, of Mae West in her performance and also another template for her career. So I, I wouldn't be surprised if she saw a few of those films when you sent her off. 
Let's talk about uh, some of the other casting because, you know, you watch this film and you're like, oh, there's John Turturro. Oh, there's Laurie Metcalf. But at the time, these were not the figures that they are now. Let's start with Aiden Quinn, who to me was... Um, th- that was Brando in uh, Streetcar Named Desire. There's something about the way he talked with the kind of marbles in his mouth and that brooding sexuality. So who, how did you discover Aiden Quinn? Well, um, you know, when we were talking about, uh, I was talking with, you know, um, Midge and Sarah, the producers, Midge uh, Sanford and Sarah Pillsbury, about who could be the leading man. And originally, again, this is 19, when we first started these conversations, it was 1983, maybe. There were a couple leading men that were coming up. Uh, Kevin Costner was one of them. Quaid, maybe Dennis Quaid, sure. another. But these were guys, we also knew that the the male role, that it was really a movie that starred two women, and that the male <laughs> You know, it was important, but wasn't one of the two main stars. It, it's funny because it's sort of a reverse of what usually happens in male-directed, written movies, where there's sort of a pretty woman who's sort of the eye candy, and there are two, you know, guys. Totally. Uh, <laughs> so we were aware that this was a reversal. So when we went out to those stars, like the cost, you know, Kevin Costner's, they didn't want to play second fiddle to. Madonna and Rosanna, <laughs> you know, they, um, and then we heard about Aiden Quinn, who had been in one other movie before, I think it was a movie called, um, Reckless, uh, I think it was directed by Jamie Foley, and it, it wasn't, it, it wasn't a hit, so he, you know, what had, was supposed to make him that take him to the next level as the star, didn't exactly. And so he was kind of available at the level he was at at that time mm-hmm. to not be threatened by Madonna and, you know, that he wasn't the male lead. Sure, <laughs> and I mean. Male star. It, it was a great launching pad for him, and he had a really great chemistry with both of them, actually. Yeah. Ah, now we're getting someplace. This is my phone number. Jim must have given it to you. It's like a deja vu. How can you have a deja vu if you don't remember anything? No, no, I mean, it, this is all deja vu. This is a Port Authority locker key. Oh. But I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to run you up to the Port Authority. Maybe what's ever in the locker will help you snap out of it. How's that? Okay. Okay? Wait a minute. This isn't some sort of trick, is it? What do you mean? I mean, I know a little bit about you, okay? So don't even consider jerking me around because I'm not in a great mood today. Sure, I mean, I wouldn't jerk you around. I don't even know you. I had heard that he and Madonna had something personal happen off of this. Is that true? (laughs) Not that. I know of. No? That's okay. interesting. I, I, can you say what? Well, just that they had an affair. I don't, I don't, I did not know of that. And I had not heard of that. I'm not saying it would surprise me, but <laughs> I did not know that. <laughs> was it that kind of set where like there was a lot of, I mean, it's a lot of young, attractive people having fun. There were, and there might have been some affairs, but that was not one that I had heard of. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah, yeah. Oh, well, hmm. I wonder which ones you had heard of. <laughs> what, what was interesting about the casting is that I was working with two new casting directors, uh, Billy Hopkins and Risa Brayman, and they were very, they had come out of the theater, uh, casting for a theater company, but they knew all the up-and-coming hot Theater, New York theater people. And so they brought their knowledge of those people to the film. And I knew a lot of the kind of uh, East Village punk film celebrities, musicians and, you know, kind of hangers on or just people who, you know, were celebrities maybe in their own mind, but lived in the East Village, you know, or <laughs> right. part of that scene. But it was the combination of those people which gave authenticity to the film, 
with these uh, up and coming theater actors who really hadn't had much film experience, like John Turturro. Maybe he was in one other film before this, but I'm not sure. Or Stephen Wright, comedian, Laurie Metcalf, who I don't believe had been in a film, but was in the uh, Steppenwolf Theater Company. And I had gone to see a show that they were doing, and she just blew me away. Gary, let me ask you something. What? Does Mm. Roberta have orgasms? I mean, did she have them with you? What about them? You have heard of them, haven't you? I mean, maybe the reason she left you was because you weren't satisfying? Leslie, not everybody is obsessed with orgasms. Some people just have them. Did she? Well, what? Did Phil Donahue do a show oh, on orgasms? Oh, you are really a pig. You oh, know that. At least I know about feelings. Feelings. I feel. I feel. Shh, you're disgusting, Gary. You're just like Daddy. No wonder Roberta left you. Would you stop saying that? Yeah, so it's just the right combination of elements. Amazing. I mean, I, just everyone you're naming are some of my favorite people of all time. Uh, Stephen Wright at the time, I, I don't know if audiences, younger people know who he is, but at the time he he kind of originated a new kind of deadpan stand-up um, that was just became the new like standard in what everyone was trying to imitate. Yeah. And was very yeah. brilliant yeah. Um, and very offbeat. And then, of course, uh, who, the the guy who plays um, Rosanna's husband, who's a kind of square hot tub salesman from New Jersey, Mark Bloom. Brilliant performance. Um, and he passed away uh, two years ago or a year and a half ago. A yeah, very tragic. Very yeah, he was actually, uh, he, he, um, he was a theater actor in New York, but he also had a sense of humor about himself. So he was able to kind of play that character, but not make him into a total cartoon, keeping him real, but just having enough ability, you know, kind of ability to make fun of himself, which was just perfect. And yes, sadly, he was one of the early uh, victims of, of COVID. COVID, yeah. It's just so tragic. Um, but yeah, like you said, he's, he's, could have been a much more of a clownish figure that you laughed at, but you you kind of understood why she was still with him um, and and what she saw, even though he he didn't have the ability to he didn't have the, the artist ability that all these other people had. And there's this amazing sequence with him and Madonna where they're getting stoned in their house in this amazingly art directed like just snapshot of the early '80s that just uh, sent me and. Um, it's so real, you know, she's kind of, the two of them are interfacing over drugs and he's kind of letting his mind open and she's sort of teasing him and it's a very special scene. I, I just loved it. And then you start to think, what's it all about? The big picture, you know what I mean? Sure I do, care. I mean, the, there's more to life than making money, right? Uh, I mean, I know that. I mean, uh, mm. you know, you know how all time comes from a single point in the universe? You know what I mean? No. There are things happening in solar systems so far away that we can't even see them. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what, what, what do they care? What do they care if I am the spa king of New Jersey? Hello. Do you remember shooting it? I do remember shooting it, and I think a little bit of it, uh, that's where he sort of was getting stoned and talking about being the spa king. And yeah. Spocking, spocking. Yeah. Sort of caught up with that word. Yes. Uh, but there was a certain. I mean, we we definitely stuck to the script because there were so many twists and turns in, in the script. We didn't want to lose any of them. But I also thought that there needed to be a certain kind of sense of it, it it needed to feel fresh and improvisational so i did encourage a certain amount of improvisation but always bringing it back to the script but that that is a scene that did have improvisation in it and uh you know there were many more <laughs> so the sh- sounds like the shoot went pretty smoothly except for some 
maybe paparazzi as you went along or? It was, I mean, every shoot has little hiccups, but basically it was a pretty smooth shoot. And it was interesting for me because it was my first union movie, which I thought was going to be, you know, I was very nervous about making the transition from being an independent filmmaker to making a studio movie. Um, but it was, it was a very easy transition. I felt like I had a really great support team. And again, probably the fact that the two producers were women and had never made a movie before. So I was the experienced movie maker on the set. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and the, you know, a female uh, screenwriter, two female stars. And the crew was very supportive. I didn't really get any, you know, of you hear horror stories about, you know, sexism and, you know, just, it being difficult for, for women to be in that kind of a you know, directorial position, I did not feel it during that movie at all. I mean, just to hear you talk about it, you've achieved everything that people are struggling so hard to try to achieve now. The, you know, the, you have the Bechdel test with like, are there having women characters having conversations about anything other than men in it? Yes, you have that throughout the entire film. D do you have a female director? Here we have you. Did you have a female, uh, behind, you know, cast and crew? I mean, uh, you know, the producers. And it's like, you've achieved this, this thing that is now considered the gold standard of what, what Hollywood wants for women. And you did it right out of the gate. You know what else was in our favor? I think that uh, because the film wasn't that expensive, for a Hollywood movie or a studio movie, $5 million wasn't that big, you know, big a deal. I think that's why I didn't have, like, uh, studio executives standing around the set looking over my shoulder. Um, so that was very liberating. And I tend to work base, uh, best when no one's watching. I mean, you know, it's really hard when you have, you know, just a lot of people, you know, sitting in chairs next to you and making suggestions as they look at the monitor. I, I couldn't work that way. So um, th the other thing that happened is that at Orion, um, at the Orion Pictures at the studio, there was a woman named Barbara Boyle, who was the, uh, I guess she was the vice president of production. She was working under Mike Medavoy. And basically, uh, it was because of her, because it was, she championed this project, that it got made. And the fact that they kind of said, okay, Barbara, We'll give you five million dollars for this little project. Um, good luck. <laughs> Basically, that's <laughs> what it was. Good luck. <laughs> well, thank you, Mike Medavoy, and thank you, Barbara Boyle, um, for for putting your your faith into this, and it, it certainly paid off. Um, one more sequence that I wanted to ask about was the danceateria, which was the the nightclub where Madonna got her star, and you filmed a whole sequence there. Jerry Glass, right? Yeah. How did you know? Wild guess. She split on you, huh? Yeah, two days ago. Well, has she ever split on you before? Oh, no, of course not. Is she into drugs? Drugs? Roberta? <laughs> She's never smoked a joint in her whole life. She's probably the straightest person in Fort Lee. Uh-huh. What are you driving at? You want something to drink? Um, no. Thanks. I, I'm on this health program, you know. No, uh, no alcohol, no sugar. You want to dance? Dance. Probably the only footage left of the dance interior, and it's an amazing scene. Uh, was that a tricky thing to, to shoot on location there? Well, it was great. Again, we were trying to capture New York, a very specific time and place. And dance interior was the cool club at that time. And, uh... You know, they kindly let us shoot during the day. They weren't open during the day. So um, so that worked out. And uh, originally, uh, I like that scene. I think that's a fun scene. Originally, it was written for Mark Blum and Madonna to be talking, standing at the bar, you know, on the script. That's what it said. They're, they're having a conversation by the bar. But then I thought... This is Madonna. We have all these great, colorful background extras. Wouldn't it be fun to see her dancing with 
Mark Blum, a, you know, this kind of suburban hot tub salesman, <laughs> you know, it, it was a great fish out of water situation. So we decide, so I decided to take the dialogue and put it in the form of a dance and having other sort of strange characters in the background and and interrupting the dance at, at one point there's a, a sort of man in a dress with a bald head uh, <laughs> who right. starts to dance with um mark blum and, and <laughs> always looking for ways to try to make it come alive and because it's really a film about two different worlds that that was the other interesting thing working with Ed Lockman and, and Santo, we were on the same page about trying to design two very different worlds, the world of um, Roberta, uh, or Rosanna Arquette, the suburban housewife, and the world of Madonna, the downtown New York world, to make the colors different, to make the lighting different, to make the set design different. Uh, Rosanna's world is all pastel colors. If you look at the clothing she wears in the beginning, it's beige. She's always dressed in beige. Um, Madonna's world, we were using a lot of colored gels to light the exteriors. You know, it's it's uh, gritty New York, but it's magical gritty New York. The lighting tries to turn the grit and the texture just to elevate it into something a little more fairy tale like and when i moved there in 1995 that's the that's the feeling you get it's grit but it's also the best place you've ever been in your life and you live there it's it's just a a special feeling i i don't know what new york's like now cuz i've been in la for over 20 years but but back then it, it was still I don't know. There was nothing like it. And I moved directly to the East Village. <laughs> so I think I have you to thank for that. So the film is done, and it sounds like, uh, did the studio, were they happy with, with your uh, cut? Yeah, you know, um, we they were happy, happy enough to have some test screenings. So that's what we did. We went to, you know, a big suburban multiplex, you know, in New Jersey somewhere, and we, and we screened it. And we learned something from that first screening, which was interesting, and that was that our original ending wasn't working. And it, it's not because the ending wasn't good. What we realized is that the film had too many endings. There were like three endings. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. the ending that's currently in there, which is in the movie theater, where we see the two couples reunited and you know, Madonna and and her boyfriend are watching a movie that then goes up in flames. Um, <laughs> and, right. you know, uh, felt like the ending, you know? And so when we got to that scene, the people in the audience, in the test screening audience, started to, like, get up out of their seat. But yet we still <laughs> had two more scenes to go. You know, we had shot a scene for the you know, the scripted ending was that the two women end up in Egypt on camels, off <laughs> on an adventure together. And while, you know, that kind of made, looked great on paper, and we shot it, uh, we shot it in a sand pit in New Jersey. We brought in camels. <laughs> um, <laughs> it didn't work in the film because it just felt like, you know, audiences were used to seeing a couple's kiss and that's the end. <laughs> right. Hollywood ending. <laughs> and then didn't Madonna record a song called Desperately Seeking Susan? I don't think she recorded she she recorded a, uh, the song that became kind of the theme song for the movie Into the Groove. Okay. I had heard that she had recorded something called Desperately Seeking Susan and never made it onto the soundtrack. I don't remember it, so... Uh, well, there you go. Don't always believe what you read on Wikipedia. But but the Into the Groove, which was sort of uh, interesting how that ended up in the film, which was the night before we went, we were about to shoot that dance scene, that dance sequence, uh, Madonna came over to me and said, I have a tape of something I've been playing around with. Do you mind if I bring it in tomorrow when we film? And you can play it. If you like it, we can play it and maybe just get the crowd as, you know, up on their feet dancing. You know, when you do a dance 
scene, you got to get everyone dancing to the same beat, then you cut off the music and you start the dialogue. So it was really just intended as a get up on your feet and dance, you know, temp track. And, you know, as is often the case when you get into the editing room, you fall in love with your temp track. (laughs) So we fell in love with it. And then she became, you know, so famous that uh, Orion uh, was willing to, you know, suddenly now buy it from her or her, you know, record company. And we used it in the movie and, and as the end title sequence. That's Into the Groove, one of her signature, most classic hits. So you probably got a good deal <laughs> early. That well, early. I don't know. At that time, she was... <laughs> she was starting to rise. <laughs> I, I was thinking she was kind of smart. Maybe, you know, she's a good businesswoman. Maybe she right. <laughs> was hoping that would happen early on. Right, of course, of course. But I love that she brought that little cassette to you because, of course, that's how her career started. She would bring her cassettes and pester the DJs at Danceteria to play them. And they said, oh, fine. They put one on and suddenly everyone went to the dance floor and the rest is history. So I love that she brought you that tape. That's a great little moment. And then the film opens and how did they market it? You know, that image of the poster of the two of them standing there is very iconic to me. Did you have any say in that? Rosanna has like a cigarette and it's kind of one leg cocked and then Madonna is kind of looking up and it's a very classic uh, image. Yeah, it's a, it's a it's a great uh, poster, but it was originally just intended to be publicity shots, um, not intended as the poster. They had Orion. I, I was in New York around this time. You know, we shot the film. I was now in New York with Andy Monshin, the editor, in the editing room. Midge and Sarah had returned to L.A., and they were sort of dealing with marketing and the release, you know, those kinds of things that producers deal with. And Orion, uh, somebody in their marketing or advertising department had shown them some, Mitch and Sarah, some mock-ups of what, how they saw the poster. And I remember them showing those images to me and they, I can't even imagine, they, they, they weren't very good. What One was a, a picture of a toaster like a metallic toaster with uh, Rosanna's uh, um, face reflected in the toaster and Madonna popping out of it like a Pop-Tart. So that was the, <laughs> that could have been the poster. <laughs> and I think that the, thankfully the producers just didn't want to go with any of those ideas. And they said, let's take a look at these um, publicity shots you know, that that the two actresses did. And um, they convinced Orion to use one of those uh, for the poster. Yeah, good good thing they did. The other sort of funny thing was they also had, at one point, the studio thought that the title wouldn't work, that no one would understand Desperately Seeking Susan, what it meant, what it referred to, which was, you know, the personal ads of that time. Um, and they wanted to change the title just to The Personals. And, you know, I can't imagine this film, you know, the desperately seeking has become such a, a kind of iconic phrase. Uh, I, I can't imagine what the film, that the film would have been as memorable if it was just The Personals. Absolutely. Thank God. <laughs> yeah. um, and so it, then it's released and it makes a lot of money. It made something like $30 million 
on your little $5 million budget. It did. And weirdly enough, it actually, uh, that was the American box office. It did really, really well abroad, which I don't think Orion realized that would happen. So it was usually successful all around Europe and Japan and South America. So they they made some decent money on the film. And it was also in the Cannes Film Festival, which helped um, with the international release. And then what about like the L.A. or New York premieres? Were they there? Do you remember those at all? The big premiere was in L.A. and Madonna was there. And uh, again, you know, I know that Rosanna, it was weird because by the end of the film, not knowing that it would end up doing well and, you know, still be it, we're still talking about it 38 years later. Um, I think she was feeling, you know, maybe a little miffed that it was being called the Madonna movie. And she was busy already moving on to her next movie, um, which was called Silverado. And I don't remember much about that movie, but she had no clue that it was going to be Desperately Seeking Susan that would really really launch her career in a in an even bigger way for sure it totally made her a star and um like i said we're 38 years later the movie holds up so beautifully it's so authentic that's what you know when you were talking about the mixture of the real east village scene and of the theater actors uh it's so hard to capture a scene like that in an entertaining way and have it not feel like hollywood trying to replicate something real and um, that's why I just think it's it's a very important film because it, it captured that moment, which I think is a very important moment of Keith Haring. And I just saw Grace Jones at the Hollywood Bowl last night. And New York was it when it came to cool downtown alternative culture. And, and um, this this movie totally encapsulated it. So thank you for making it. Thank you <laughs> for being so complimentary. <laughs> but, but it is about, it's, it's you know, success is a certain element of luck and timing. You, you have to be there with the goods. But there's a lot of good movies that don't have the luck or the timing. And it's just every once in a while, all those things converge. And, uh, and y- you, you can't plan that or predict that that's going to happen. But when it does, it's, uh, it's magic. And I just feel fortunate that I was lucky. <laughs> I, I think it's more than luck. You're being modest. It, it took your talent and your vision. So, um, so again, Susan Solomon, thank you so much. This was such a treat for me. Uh, it's one of my favorite movies of all time. And um, uh, thank you so much for being so generous and, and, and telling all these great stories. Thank you, Seth. It was fun talking with you. I couldn't resist, and I delved into the THR archive to find out what we said about Desperately Seeking Susan when it came out. And in our review dated March 25th, 1985, it was generally quite positive. Let's just get to what the reviewer said about Madonna. As for Madonna, her virgin thespic endeavor is neither more no less than what one might expect from her music videos. Flashing the navel that catapult her to the top of the pop charts, she comes across as a pint-sized Mae West, cracking wise and looking sultry in a matter that obviously comes quite easy. So there you go. <laughs> Madonna, of course, went on to not such great heights with her following films, Who's That Girl, in which she uh, starred opposite Griffin Dunn, who will be with us later this season, and with Sean Penn, her ex-husband, whom she starred in Shanghai Surprise. Both of those were kind of trashed, but she went on, of course, to huge stardom on MTV and uh, in the radio charts. So once again, I want to thank Susan Seidelman. It was such a thrill to interview her about Desperately Seeking Susan, a very ahead of its time feminist first comedy that I really love. You can watch that on Paramount+. Plus. If you want to get ready for next week's episode, we're doing The Warriors, which brings us back to New York a few years earlier. This is 1978, and it's a sort of sci-fi gangland post-apocalyptic uh, adventure film, a bit silly, but also quite gripping. And it was directed by Walter Hill, who will be with us to talk all things The Warriors. You can see that one on Showtime and Paramount+. Plus. So get watching The Warriors, and until next time, I'll see you in Hollywood. Hollywood.